to the motherfucking relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Okay, we'll start with this. An update in what is supposed to be the Claricia Shields, Shields versus Shields, Keith Shields, Thurman Shields. fight. Keith Thurman has accepted Clarissa Shields' call-out, saying, We can let you try to showcase your skills. I probably use my jab only for charity. I'd make that happen. I'd wear bigger gloves and let her wear headgear. I don't really want to punch a girl in the face. He imparted that quote to the best women's boxing show. I saw it. And when I saw it, I didn't get the impression that Keith was all that receptive to this idea. Being honest with you, I got the notion, the impression, that Keith was just being nice. That he was trying to show some reverence for Clarissa Shields' status as one of the best women boxers without being too vulgar, too insulting. Clarissa herself is reveling in it, saying, we'll go 10 rounds. I'm winning seven of them easy. Why not 12? If you're in such a hurry to prove that you can hang with the boys and you can fight like a man, fight with a man, why are you fighting for 10 rounds instead of 12? Hopefully not two minute rounds instead of three. Keith is not a woman. He's not a woman boxer. If you want to prove that you can hang with a man. Why are you setting rules for a girl? Fixing the match to accommodate yourself, the woman fighter, when you're supposed to be proving that you're as good as any man. You see, there's sweet science, applied sciences, things like throwing a proper jab and being balanced, having good footwork. There are those things, but then there is the physical. And it seems to me like what Clarissa doesn't want to accept is that a guy, a man, even a welterweight, a smaller man, could hurt her. In spite of all her accolades, her two Olympic gold medals, and how many belts she's won in the pro ranks, a pro boxer, a male boxer. She wants to, he knocks her out. She continued, LOL, it's the crying for me. We love you, quote, but you ain't knocking out women. How are you gonna knock out Keith Thurman? I never said I'd knock him out. I said I think I can outbox him. But hey, even that got y'all upset. So long as you fix the rules like you're fighting a girl, you're fighting a guy. Looking to emasculate one, if they were to fight under the rules, the suggestions, if you will, that Keith Thurman set, that she gets to wear headgear and he'll just use his jab. It's not a real fight. Clarissa wouldn't be proving anything. Keith Thurman, all he'd be proving is that he's willing to entertain her, he's willing to be nice and go easy on her, but the event or the exhibition itself, it wouldn't prove anything. Clarissa has been posting sparring footage of herself with male boxers, but sparring isn't fighting. It's sparring, it's preparation. She says that she tells her sparring partners not to go easy on her, but it's still just sparring. Go into a sparring session. The intention isn't to go in there and incapacitate your sparring partner, whereas in a fight, that is your intention. It's your intention to incapacitate your opponent, to hurt them, to knock them out. She's doing it for attention. She added, y'all, the reason I'm trending, I'm in the gym already, getting ready for one time. She's doing it for attention. See, what you have to ask yourself is... If she's in such a hurry to prove that she can hang and bang with a mailbox or a pro just like herself, then why is she looking at a welterweight? Why is she talking about 10 rounds instead of 12? Why are we talking about two minute rounds instead of three? That's what the boys use, three minute rounds. 12 three minute rounds. If you really want to prove that you can hang and bang with the boys, that's what you should be doing. Otherwise, this doesn't prove anything. All it really proves is that Clarissa is a bully of sorts, putting Keith Thurman in an awkward position in order to emasculate him, thereby humiliate him, humiliate him in front of everyone. If he actually goes through with this, I don't think he should. Journalist and TV personality, Dimitri Obelor, said it best. Clarissa Shields is a goat for sure, but there's a difference between men and women's sports. And I just don't see the upside for Thurman. She's bigger than him, but still, if she boxed a man in her weight class like Triple G or Jermall Charlo, lights out. And no one is trying to see that. Well, that's why she's targeted Keith Thurman specifically. Him specifically. In my previous video where we first talked about this, I told you that Clarissa Shields landed on Keith Thurman and it wasn't by accident. To her, he seems like low-hanging fruit. Less than a man. And she looks to prove that by humiliating him in a boxing match. Thereby emasculating him. She's a bully. Because if he were to give her the energy that she's giving him 
and full-on fights this broad, he'd knock her out. She'd got the power to keep him off. If he responded to her aggression with aggression. Demetria continued, Keith Thurman put himself in a lose-lose situation with Clarissa Shields. At best, you beat up a girl. At worst, you lose all credibility and become forever known as the guy who lost to a girl. No upside, bad precedent. She's right. For Keith Thurman, there's no upside in this. If he were to treat Clarissa the same as he'd treat a man, full-on fights her and he hurts her, all that would teach her a lesson, nobody would give him credit for it, and if anything, he'd be lambasted for it. If he were to go easy on her and she starts tagging him... Any success she has, any success at all, will be humiliating for Keith Thurman, and that's what people would do. They would publicly shame him and humiliate him. Ask yourself why Keith Thurman and not somebody else, somebody in her own division, her own weight class. Why not a middleweight or a super middleweight? She knows what she's doing. She's not stupid. In terms of form and function, she might be a very good boxer, but it's the physical. She's not stronger than a man. Even though Keith Thurman isn't what he used to be, I firmly believe if he wanted to hurt Clarissa, he would hurt Clarissa. Could, but she can't hurt him. She can't knock out girls. She's not going to knock him out. I think the best way to deal with somebody like Clarissa Shields, even when they mention you by name, is how Gennady Golovkin dealt with her. He didn't deal with her at all. He didn't respond to her mention of wanting to box him. He didn't take her seriously. I feel like that would have been the best course of action for Keith Thurman. You can't take the call out seriously. You can't take Clarissa seriously. She's a toxic person. She just wants to humiliate you. You can't even give her the same energy that she's giving you, so you might as well not even bother with it. It's a no-win scenario for Keith Thurman. That if he ended up humiliating her in the process of her trying to humiliate him, he'd be the bad guy. If he knocks her out, he's wrong, right? Better off not playing her game. She's a very childish and toxic person and it's best to not deal with somebody like that at all. My thoughts. Men's welterweight news, the continued fallout of this past weekend's action. Terrence Crawford's trainer, Brian Bo Mac McIntyre, on Spence. He was slow as shit, and he was basic. How many times did you hear me say that Errol is basic? I've said that about a number of the PBC's premier boxing champions, and Errol was one among them. He's a good fighter, but he's basic. Too basic for Terrence, anyway. He's basic, man. McIntyre said of Spence in an interview with Fight Hype, Remember the last interview Spence said? Well, he's good at fundamentals. I'm fundamentally sound. After the first round, he was slow as shit. He's slow. He's got that will and determination, but he was slow. Look at the counters. Counters. Crawford's hands was fast as shit. He, Spence, he was basic. McIntyre explained how simple strategies attuned to Spence's movements led Crawford to the victory. Listen, listen. Look at all his fights, McIntyre said. All of his fights start with a jab. Remember I told you Crawford has a better jab than Errol? So you've got a good jab. You got a good double jab. But but on his double jab, the fighters he's been fighting. These fighters can't mitigate distance the same way that Terrence can because they ain't got feet like Terrence. So you've got a good jab, you've got a good double jab, but on his double jab, the fighters he's been fighting, you can't be still. Don't be still in the middle of the ring. Once you get closer to the ropes, you've got to move side to side, take a half step back. Very simple. You heard me say it in the corner. The only time he throws a double jab, he throws that double jab, then he goes to the body. It's when you're close to the ropes. Make sure you have some room to work. When you have some room to work, you take a half step back and you start going side to side. Real simple. Real simple. Many are saying that Derek James was too dismissive of Terrence Crawford in preparing Errol and that if he has been the recipient of praise for Errol's successes, then surely he should be the recipient of criticism for his failure. This is what I warned you about. That Errol Spence Jr.'s approach is too simple, and what he basically does is bulldoze, guys. That's what he does. Not gonna work on Terrence. Now everyone is singing his praises. Terrence is the talk of the town. Kenny Porter, the father of Sean Porter, praises Terrence Crawford, saying, He has made us all believers. I bow down to him. Most people that picked Errol Spence Jr. picked Errol on the predication that Errol was stronger than Terrence Crawford because he was bigger. That presupposition. I seldom ever heard anybody say that Errol was a better boxer than Terrence. Now, Kenny Porter said, well, since you mention his name, congratulations to Terrence Crawford, Porter told Fight Hub TV. I bowed down to him. I actually thought Errol would win. 
Terrence, like myself and lots of other people, he has made us all believers. He put on a spectacular performance, second to none in my recent memory. The last 10, 15 years, off the top of my head, I can't recall anyone putting on that type of performance at that high level. Kenny Porter, like many of you out there, probably picked Errol on the premise that Errol is bigger, so that in effect makes him stronger. But I didn't for a number of reasons. One was the amount of time that Errol has spent at the weight, one, the amount one, of time he's one. spent out of action, two, and that two, if nothing else, two. Terrence Crawford, he comes from a wrestling background. Three, you have to have three, a lot of core three. strength to wrestle, you know. That if the other two intangibles are not a factor, perhaps that one might be. That Terrence Crawford is a naturally strong fighter, even if he's not a big fighter. Kenny Porter continued, when we talk about a high-level fighter against the lower guy, yeah, we've seen it, Porter continued, but when we talk about elite against elite, we haven't seen that type of performance put on the way that he did it. So much respect to him. I am truly a believer. In my eyes, Crawford is the pound for pound top fighter in the world. So much talk about weight, Errol being weight drained. So much talk about potential neurological damage going into the fight. Intangibles, that's all that stuff is. Intangibles, stuff that you don't know how tangible it is or isn't. Would have a tangible effect. So many that are commentating on how Errol looked when he was getting hit, but not why. Why was he getting hit? It's because he's too simple. Too simple for Terrence. Terrence Crawford, who dominated him. And on that premise, unbeaten up and comer from Philadelphia, Jaron Ennis doesn't see the point of a Crawford versus Spence rematch. I don't either. Though some are still holding out hope that because Junior Middle would be a healthier weight for Errol, he might be a little bit stronger there and more durable. Jaron Ennis stated, Bud did his thing. Spence was just off, flat. He wasn't moving his head. He was getting hit with a lot of shots, but did his thing. Spence was just off, slow. Timing was bad. The time off might have definitely affected his timing, but that's his own fault and his team. Many of the PBC's fighters, their champions, they go into these big fights coming off of year-long layoffs. You think about Spence going into this fight, Stefan Fulton going into the Inui fight, the upcoming Jermel Charlo versus Canelo Alvarez fight. Jermel hasn't fought in a year, over a year. If Terrence Crawford, who was a network and promotional free agent, could still find the time to participate in a tune-up fight so that he could stay sharp, then surely Errol could have, but he didn't. In Errol's own words, he doesn't believe in tune-up fights. It ain't no point. It was one-sided, Jaron Ennis added. There's no point in a second fight between Terrence Crawford and Errol Spence Jr. So is Errol Spence damaged goods now? It's entirely possible that that car accident took something out of Errol that he perhaps could never get back. It's possible. But it's not like he hasn't fought since then because he has. You know, he had the Danny Garcia fight. Passed his medicals for that. He had the Jordanis Ugas fight. Passed his medicals for that. And he passed his medicals for this, so I don't want to jump to conclusions about neurological damage or potential neurological damage just seems convenient that neurological damage was not an issue in any of the two aforementioned fights he had before he fought Crawford and it wasn't an issue going into the fight but as soon as he loses everybody turns into Dr. Spock Dr. Scholes maybe he just lost it about a boxer well, uh, let me let me go back to the do you feel like somebody who switches stances you know goes orthodox at all do you feel like that Hey, 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 let me stop that shit. That's some dumb shit. Right? <laughs> when you, you listen, when you, when you boxing, that's some new shit, right? You know, listen, man. Okay, whatever, man. Nobody care about that stuff, man. You for real? <laughs> Carol Brooks switched up, but he only did it twice. You know, we, most of these guys try that crap, man. Listen, man. Yeah. Like this. If you prepare for it, what's, what's your benefit? I mean, we, we prepare, but I'm just, Oh, man, oh, man, listen, man, that's, that's some dumb shit, man. Listen, <laughs> boxing is about technique, not about more. Boxers today are more about athleticism. Okay. Athleticism, not about skill and technique. We're okay. not saying Berlin wasn't athletic. We're saying he won with his skills. See what I'm saying? These guys win with their technique. Well, they, leave, they win with their athleticism, their speed, their quickness. When, like I said, some guys who fight, who have fought, they lost their athleticism, they started getting knocked out. Just like regular people. Just like everybody else. Do you see how dismissive Derek James was of strategy, tactics, and techniques as opposed to the physical, as opposed to things like strength and athleticism? Those are both physicalities. That's what the both of those are. Physicalities. When asked about Terrence Crawford being ambidextrous, 
ahead of this past weekend's fight. Do you see how dismissive Derek was? And many will tell you that being ambidextrous, being able to fight both orthodox and southpaw, it's useful because it creates new openings from either stance. It can help to condition an opponent to defend punches from, say, an orthodox fighter, and then you switch over to southpaw, and he's like a deer in the headlights. Because he's conditioned to fighting an orthodox fighter after a couple of rounds. Derek James's training methods and his methodology seems to rely on the physical condition of the fighter. The physical, and it's not a coincidence that Errol, that's what he is. At his very best, he's a bulldog. Dozer, or he tries to be. Bulldozer with a lot of tells. You think about how easy Errol was for Terrence Crawford to read and what Brian Bo McIntyre said that, you know, Errol will throw a double jab right before he goes to the body. It's a pattern. He'll throw that double jab, back the guy into the ropes, then once he's got him pinned down, he'll start going to his midsection. Right. Terrence was able to read that and offset it by taking a half step back, then once he feels his back is on the ropes, moving to the side. And you don't need to be the most athletic fighter in the world in order to do that. In in order to take a half step back. Errol's got other tells, like that looping left of his. You know, Errol is a southpaw, so his left hand is his power hand. In the fight, we saw Terrence Crawford catching and countering Errol Spence Jr.'s looping left hand with a right hook, a right hook out of the southpaw stance. A catch and counter right hook. I don't think Derek James is a bad trainer just because one of his fighters, his star fighter, took a devastating loss this past weekend. I'm just telling you that his methodology seems to rely on the physical. How many times did I tell you that Errol's not a cerebral fighter, you know? He fights the same fight, fight to fight. If you've seen one of his fights, you've basically seen them all, as far as what he's going to do in the fight. Now it's being called into question as to whether Derek James is a good trainer or not. It's being called into question as to whether or not Derek James failed. Errol Spence Jr., I think that's a gross oversight. I think that when you're fighting a fighter, the caliber of a Terrence Crawford, that's actually very hard to prepare for. To prepare your fighter. Any fighter, any trainer is going to struggle to prepare their fighter for somebody like Terrence Crawford. So I don't think we should just throw the whole trainer away when it comes to Derek James. He's got his ways. Some good, some bad. And his comments about methodology, technique, and tactics have aged poorly now that the fight is over. That by itself doesn't make him a bad trainer. It just means he relies more on the physical than the technical.